come out later on. You also will be able to want to see things from his viewpoint. Try to pretend you are your enemy. Try to pretend you are in his culture. Then what? How does he think? Because then you start discerning his weaknesses, his strength, and the kind of things he's doing. And you just say, "Well, this is the way it is. We're doing the best we can. You're going to make a lot of blunders." We call mirror image. That's one of the bad things we did during Vietnam. After all, we Americans, with all our technology, are far superior to Vietnamese. We knew what we were doing. There a bunch of goddamn jungle bunnies to help. <laughs> I'm over-dramatizing, but I'm really trying to bring that point home. Very important. In fact, I heard a guy the other day said, you know, if you really think about Vietnam, we not only didn't know our adversary, we didn't even know ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then this you'll see very often in his state. Shape enemy's perception or shape his view of the world. So you can manipulate his plans, his actions, his strategies, his tactics. He doesn't say it directly. He's always talking about shaping his adversary, not being shaped by him. But if you screw it all together, he's talking about really shaping his perception so he can influence his plans and actions. Obviously, not to his advantage. Likewise, he doesn't want to become shaped because then he's going to have problems. Very important. And then the third point: attack enemy's plans as best policy, or attack his strategy as best policy. Now, when I briefed this a few years ago in the Pentagon, this was an assistant secretary level guy said, "Well, how can you do that if you don't have his plan?" The guy didn't even understand the sense of it. It's very simple. As remember, if you get inside his system, understand what he's going to do, then in a very general sense, and you keep moving about, what's going to happen? You begin to shape him. He starts drawing up plans that are not useful to the unfolding situation. So if you don't even know the exact plan, they're useless. So in that sense, you have a tactics You have a tactics plan. Maybe not directly, but indirectly. You don't have to have them. If you get them, great. If you find out, not so good. But you don't have to have them. Next best disrupt his alliances. Of course, we've all heard that before, you know, like Julius Caesar, divide and conquer. In other words, split them up so they can't work together, then use a large fraction of your strength against a small fraction of his. Another, another variation of strength against weakness. Next best, attack his army. Note that third best. In any case, before you attack his army, you want to do all the preceding. Because you want to place an army in a weakened condition so when you hit it, it comes unglued. And then last of all, he says attack cities only when there's no alternative. And you have some very vivid descriptions there why you don't want to do that. You can avoid it. You may have to do it. And guess what? It's as true today as it was in his day. The only thing different is the instruments we use. Still true. Talk in the end. City fighting is tough. And then, finally, this point. Employ Chang and Chi maneuvers as a basis to pump your strength into his weakness and do it over and over again. So it raises a rather interesting question: What the hell is Chang and Chi maneuver? <laughs> so how many people here saw the movie Pat? You recall there were two instances there where he said, "Hold him by the nose and kick him in the rear." His language is a little bit more colorful, but uh, basically that's what he's referring to. Now you can think of holding him by the nose as being related to the Chang and the kick him in the rear as being related to the Chi. Now let me broaden the notion. Yeah. Think of the chain as being the direct, the chi as being the indirect. Or think of the chain as being the expected, the chi as being the unexpected. Or think of the chain as being the obvious, the chi as being the hidden. You can lay out all various combinations. So in a sense what you're saying, the chain, you're using the chain to get to expose his vulnerability weakness to your chi so you can dive into him and pull him apart. In other words, it's kind of a, in a mental sense, it's a form of combined arms. You do one thing to get him to expose his vulnerability weakness to another thing, and then you exploit it to the nth degree. You do it morally, mentally, physically. So it gives you the base. The chain is to try to be able to find out what those vulnerabilities and weaknesses are so they can be exploited with your chain. And you change it back and forth. In any case, what was his desired outcome? Note the first quote. If you want to win the whole nine yards without fighting, so do an enemy without fighting. In any event, if you do have to fight or go to war, try to at least to avoid a protracted war. So here we see sort of the ideas and philosophy of Sun Tzu, and they're as good today as they were in his day. So rather a timeless kind of philosophy. With that in mind then, let's push on. Let's look for a historical pattern. Let's look at some early commanders. Here we see, I just have words like the Alexander, Alexander the Great, roughly around 300 BC, Hannibal roughly 200 BC, Belisarius, Byzantine.
commander, roughly around 500 AD. Genghis Khan around 400, Tamerlan around 1400 AD. And what's my point? All these commanders seem consistent with the ideas of Sun Tzu in one way or the other. But there was a difference between them. The Western commanders I indicate here are more, more directly concerned with winning the battle. Whereas the Eastern commanders were trying to get their adversary all pulled apart before they even hit the army so it comes totally in blue. So in that sense, Eastern commanders weren't closely attuned to the ideas of Sun Tzu. Of course, here I'm referring specifically to Genghis Khan and Tamerlan. Remember, they had access to Sun Tzu, though. All right, there is some suspicion Belisarius may have had to do time later. In any case, all of them, one way or another, also planned this chain in Shia. Dazzle them here, hose them here. <laughs> Got to get the dazzle first, so you set them up with the vulnerability. Get the vulnerability. The dazzle is to create the vulnerability. And of course, that's the point. Okay, with that in mind, these Chang Chi notions seem to be rather important. So it leads me to this following comment. Since these seem to be important, I want to give you a little bit of feel for what they mean. First, in a tactical sense, the next in a battle or grand tactical sense. Chang Chi. So let's look at some early notions of what we call that, that play upon tactics. And what we see here, we call about an early tactical theme. In which, and the only reason why the date's truncated 300 BC to 1400 AD because these weapons start going out around 1400. And you had two kinds of troops, light troops and heavy troops. I'll let you read it, then I'll comment on it. Not 
there is an interesting notion associated with that fact, which others noticed, and I lifted this right out of a Soviet book, a translation of the Soviet book, Basic Principle of Operational Art and About the Battle of Luther, and we're talking about angles that Marx and Engels made. He understood the significance of it. In other words, an unequal distribution of forces across the front. I'm going to point that later on. It's a very important idea of unequal distribution in order to gain leverage in things. Very important idea. As a matter of fact, Sun Tzu understood. For you people who read Sun Tzu, he said it differently with the same idea. He said, he who prepares and reinforces everywhere is everywhere weak. That applies unequal distribution. He who prepares and reinforces everywhere is everywhere weak. Frederick the Great later on said, He who defends everywhere defends nowhere. And when we come forward, you'll see that. Very important in your activities, too. As a matter of fact, I'll preempt myself here. Napoleon, one time, related to the same idea. Napoleon, one time, why? He had his marshals the defense of a France. And it was his time to review it. He looked at it. He saw all these guys strung out along the border. And he said, what are you trying to do? Stop smuggling? <laughs> <laughs> Same idea. They're trying to defend everything. Okay. We're going to come back to this. I just want to make that point. Now let's look at two more battles and we'll fold up. Battle of Arbella, or probably more appropriately called Gaudinette which we have the uh, Persians under the Persians under Darius and the Greeks under Alexander. The Persians outnumbered Alexander. Alexander brought, brought his weight over here to the Persian left or toward his right. And he began to make his advance. The Persians then saw weakness in the uh, Alexander's front, sent some of their troops in here, and that left a gap in their front. Alexander adjusted his stroke and went for that gap. And the result then Inside out, single Belgian scheme. Darius, <laughs> very confused, of course, for Darius fled, fled, excuse me, and Alexander won the battle. Very famous battle. Very nearly. He barely won it, nevertheless, won the battle. One more. The Battle of Canaan. Date indicated, roughly 216 BC. And we see here the Romans under this very uniform array going against the Carthaginians under the command of Hamilton, which he put his weakest troops forward, his better infantry in his left and right wings here, his heavy cavalry in his left, right cavalry, his light cavalry in his right, and the Carthaginian cavalry was actually had about the same number as the Roman cavalry, plus it was better. In any case, they drove off the Roman cavalry, came in behind the front in conjunction with the cavalry in the right, on the near right of the Roman left here, forced the Roman cavalry to leave the field. In the meantime, why the, the Romans here pushed back the center, and stepped into the bag, so to speak. The Senate, the wings closed in, the cavalry came back, battle of encirclement, battle of annihilation. In which, depending upon the different accounts you read, uh, Hannibal lost around 7,000 troops, the Romans somewhere between 50,000 and 70,000. You can see what happened when they all started closing, they got to change all their formations. In the meantime, they're pulling them apart. They can't cope. They have to change from everything else. Very ponderous. So what's my point here? Well, there's a so-called principle of war called concentration. Well, if you look at that, the Romans weren't concentrating Carthaginians, they lost. Marathon. The Persians weren't concentrating the Greeks, they lost. And we see this happening over and over. So first few times of reaching military people in this, they got very they wait a minute, that's unfair. You've got to think of concentration. They start throwing all the caveats in as well. If you have to throw all the caveats in, the principle has no meaning. Many other kind of examples. What, what's the impression I'm trying to leave you with? And it goes like this. If you look at any one of these battles, in one way or another, they're emphasizing unequal distribution as a basis for leverage and success. In fact, that's what we're talking about always here. Some kind of unequal distribution or uneven distribution. And never gain leverage. And the clap your adversary's resistance. Well, if that's the case, unequal distribution is a key idea. Then, if you begin to think about it, concentration and dispersion 
are nothing more than aspects on equal distribution. In other words, if you concentrate some areas, you disperse the others. They're both fold under the idea of, of unequal distribution. Yet we don't have a principle of war called dispersion, we have a principle of war called concentration. We'll get into that later. We'll begin in my erosive, erosive attack upon the principle of war, as you probably know. In any case, you begin to see these kind of things begin to play out. You see many authors, historians, other people notice the so called moral effect. The disturbing effect of flank attack or surprise or those kind of things, how that builds doubt, fear, and all those kind of things people can't seem to cope. We don't know what it is yet. We're going to gather that information so we can sort of pin that down and see what we're talking about. With that in mind, let's push on. Come closer to the present. Let's look at Genghis Khan and the boys. And we see some advantages he had over his adversary. Mobility, communication, intelligence, and leadership. Intelligence and return to their intelligence service. He has sent mobility. Asiatic pony army. Each trooper had more than one pony. And those ponies were trained from birth to follow the, the pony the trooper was astride. They didn't have to have any tethered. So if one got tired, they just shift to another back and forth. And they just go 50 and 60 miles a day, day after day, foraging, moving on their adversary. So in that context, in that sense, they had much greater mobility than their, than their adversary. As a matter of fact, up to the present time, they had the greatest strategic mobility in the army in history. I'm not saying we should go back to the Asiatic ponies. Remember, I'm talking about a very broad sense, but we have to operate the air, sea, and other kinds of pony strategic contact. Communication. They operate in very wide arrays, very spread out in terms between their major units. Yet they were able to operate in a concerted manner because they had not only messengers of courier service, signal devices like mirrors in them, so they could work together. Plus a great deal of previous training so each one could sort of understand what the other guy was doing without obviously a great deal of communication. And that's it. We'll talk about that just a minute. I'll come back. Their intelligence service. They penetrated all the way down to Genoa and Venice, totally inside their adversary system. Their adversary didn't even know what they were up. In other words, they were inside their adversary's mind. Or their adversary's orientation, which means you get inside sort of the of them. Their leadership, under the first great con, Genghis later, of a kind today we call you lead by general intention decide what's going to be done, the commanders on the spot determine how it's going to be carried out. They're responsible. Very important idea today, which we seem to violate and cause enormous difficulty. And the theme for operations indicated, note all the kinds of things they're doing here. The idea is to try to pull their adversary apart, exploit their vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Very fast-paced, fast-tempo operations. And also the use of propaganda and terror in order to <coughs> destroy their adversary's resolve. And the way they would do it is an illustrative example. If they were going to take a city, or if one city held out too long, they'd slaughter all but a few of the inhabitants, let the other inhabitants go to the other city and say, if you surrender early, you're not going to have to go through this slaughtering. That sort of breaks down resistance. <laughs> Another way they did it was when they're going to take a, a province or a city, somebody was resisting too long, they'd march all the other citizens out front, so if they wanted to defend, they had to destroy their own citizens. I mean, these people weren't pleasant people. Let's see, that kind of drains away the result. I'm not saying we should do that, I'm just saying that's what they did. It's not the In any case, their aim was quite simple. But note what I say here. Why do we separate strategic maneuver? Let me give you a feel for that by looking at this next schematic. Here we have a schematic of the invasion of the Charisma Empire. The what empire? Charisma Empire. Modern day Afghanistan area, you know, some of the areas where we've got problems in the world right now. And here we have these four units coming through as indicated here. Note the scale of miles. If you superimpose over that, you find out that Genghis Khan is coming in on the front over 500 miles wide. Just take this mentally. You just superimpose up here. He's coming in the front over 500 miles wide. 200,000 troops coming in an area over 500 miles wide. Not only that, they were outnumbered by the Shah and the Prism Empire. Outnumbered by their enemies. 
matter of fact, the Mongols were almost always outnumbered by the adversary, yet they still won. In any case, there's an early engagement by a Mongol detachment with a large force under the Shah down here. And even though the Shah won the engagement, it so unnerved him, he stretched his forces out along this river, and the Mongols went up one by one. In the meantime, Genghis Khan came out of the desert and sacked the car. All of them came together and sacked Samarakhan and conquered it. There's a number. So, you know, that, that isn't much of a concentration when you have your forces spread out over the mountain. Coming back with an idea. So it raises a rather interesting question, which military men particularly appreciate. Even though outnumbered, why were the Mongols able to move and why they scattered the raids without being defeated separately or in detail? That's one of the reasons why they want to be concentrated, because armies worry about being defeated separately or in detail. If the Mongols got away with it, so maybe there's an important notion, an important idea there. Why were they able to get away with it? Can we surface that or bring it out in sharp relief. Let's attempt that. And so here's the message and the result. I'll let you read it and I'll comment on it. Point. The Mongols were able to operate at a faster tempo rhythm than their adversary. Or is their adversary not? By being operated at a faster tempo or pace, by having advantage these kinds of things we've talked about, what does that permit them to do? They can play the dispersion concentration game in its widest possible sense. On the other hand, if you're operating very slowly and can't adapt very much, you better keep your force together, otherwise you're going to be what? Defeated separately or detail. So if you had the tempo or patient, you could play the dispersion concentration game as wide as possible since if you don't, it would be forced to operate in a more concentrated and more focused, less adaptive manner. Let me give an illustration of that. How many people here have read uh, Clausewitz? Anybody? Well, in his book eight, he has a long discussion about the ideas of concentration and what he calls speed, or what we call tempo or pace long discussion in matter of And in there, when he's talking about concentration, he laid out four exceptions to the idea of concentration. In terms of the idea of speed, no exception. Well, if there's no exceptions to speed, there are some to concentration in the premier idea of speed, not concentration. Not only that, when you read very carefully those exceptions, you find out if you can operate at a faster tempo than the adversary, then you're permitted to make those. You don't have to abide by the principle of concentration. Another illustration, and I'll preempt myself here again. The British down in North Africa, early 1940s against Rome. One of the things they complained about when they lost, they weren't operating in a concentrated manner. And Rome was able to do it. They missed the whole point. The reason why Rome was able to take them out there for a while was because he's operating at a faster tempo or pace. Sometimes he's operating wide space arrays, other times tight, he was working one between the other. So the key idea, if you can operate at a faster tempo or pace, it gives you greater freedom of action. You can play this dispersion concentration game as wide as possible sense. If not, then you're combined. Yet in our principles of war, we don't have a principle of speed, only a principle of concentration, which means we don't even understand that idea. But the Russians, in one of their principles of war, do have the principle of speed or tempo or pace. Even more Remember I said different countries, they lay out those principles differently. Well, oh, yeah, not only that, they were also reading wrong communications. Not only that, he was also in Europe when that attack took place. <laughs> they knew he was there. He was on medical leave. Did, did that limit the Germans' ability to maneuver because Rommel wasn't there? Well, no, they didn't know it was coming. So remember, they had a lot of deception. They had a beautiful deception campaign you want to read about. It. And all of a sudden, this whole thing folded over. What he's saying is that the British were successful in this case. I'm going to intelligence. 
and all yeah, that. Many things. Remember, when I'm talking about Udo, you're not just talking about speed. Remember, you've got to have as many things that fits in that. That'll become evidence when we go through it. I'm just laying on preemption. Yeah, you can go fast and go right over a cliff. <laughs> no, we're a little bit more refined than that. Okay. That'll become evidence we go through. I'm just laying some preemptions here. Going. You'll see that you'll get a feel for it. Remember, you don't have to be... There's, in fact, the question was raised to me. In one of my discussions, I said, well, geez, each guy goes faster and faster, pretty soon you're all going crazy. Said, no, you don't have to do it that way. You're thinking wrong. If he's fast, you have to be faster. If you're slow, you want him slower. You can always slow him down, as long as your pace is fast. It makes no difference whether you're going... Remember that. It's relative. You don't have to go super fast. If you can't go faster, as long as you can slow him down, then you're faster. Even if you're slow, he's slower. Same thing. Just keep that in mind. Don't, don't you lose your perspective. Because you'll see out in terms of gorillas, the way they go against their adversary, we say they go faster speed. They're not moving that fast. Their adversary is even slower than so you have to keep that perspective in mind all the time. Like I said, otherwise just going speed over a cliff. I'm not talking about just physical cliffs, also mental cliffs. So you want to keep those perspectives in mind. Okay? With that in mind, let's come closer to the present. Here's the Battle of Waiting. The only reason why I show you this the later theorist drew a great deal of significance from this battle. Matter of fact, John did not get that later on. But in any case, what we see here is we see the Austrians spread out, as indicated here. Frederick the Great was forced here. He was outnumbered greatly by the Austrians, I think about two to one. Came behind the screen hills and put his weight against the Austrian uh, wing here. Plus, he can't stretch out some diversionary operations here and won a fantastic victory. Basically, all you're really seeing here is a more modern replay of the Battle of Luther, a single outflank there, a single adult. It's more modern, modern uh, replay of it in that context. Now, with that in mind, let's come even closer. And here we see some what I call 18th century theoreticians. Sachs, Forsay, Guibert, and Dutile. They're the plan of several branches, primarily of a tribunal to Forsay. So he won variation of his plan. In other words, it gives him the idea of trying to get his adversary's vulnerability to be. That plan of several branches. Mobility and fluidity of force, they all thought about it. Cohesion. Pull all these things together, and you play the so-called dispersion and concentration game. I'll show you later on how Napoleon played the dispersion concentration game. He did it in a particular